Well, this is definitely the most uh, beautiful conference venue I've ever been to. To be honest, it's a little bit distracting to see the beautiful sparkling ocean here <laughs> while presenting. <laughs> Uh, but I am very excited to be here, uh, and thank you for joining my talk. My name is uh, Mike, and this is the Beginner's Guide to C++'s, C++'s Best Kept Secret Standard Algorithm. Um, so our goals for today, uh, this talk is almost all motivation. I am going to be showing quite a bit of code, but I think I'm going to, uh, hopefully when you leave here, will be very excited about learning more about standard algorithm and some of the available facilities. I'm going to try to convince you to take your code, which is on the left side, which we're going to look at, uh, and turn it into something that's on the right side. Uh, so immediately, you can see, again, I'm not asking you to read all of this right now. Uh, there's fewer lines of code uh, on the right side. Uh, I'm going to try to convince you we'll have more confidence our code's correct. Our code's going to be more maintainable and easy to reason about. And again, just begin your exploration into standard algorithms. So I'm going to be your tour guide on this journey. And again, for those of you here in Folkestone, uh, do walk on the zigzag path here. <laughs> um, so just a little bit about me. I teach at Northeastern University. I'm a teaching faculty there. I do research, consulting. Um, and you can find out more about me on my website, um, YouTube, these types of things. Um, I do a lot of graphics programming. Uh, and these slides, at the least, will be on my website, if not the conference uh, venue. Uh, code for the talk is also available um, on my GitHub publicly. It's already there if you'd like to play around with any of the examples. And of course, the abstract that uh, brought you here. Uh, so what you're going to learn today um, is, again, something that I found is all too often very secret, the standard algorithm uh, library. Uh, so if you're a student, I think this is a great talk for you if you're taking a C++ course. Um, and on the other end, if you've seen standard algorithm and are a trainer or other educator, I hope this is going to change a little bit about how you approach teaching C++, uh, whether it's you know C++ 20 or beyond. Uh, or we're really going to find out C++ 98 even and beyond <laughs> still applies and has the standard algorithm available. So I want to just give a quick story here um, about my long journey learning C++, um, and again, why this talk sort of exists here. So I think I had a very traditional path in learning C++. Uh, I took uh, a custom uh, version of a C++ course around 2008 or 2009, uh, where I was learning C++, and I never saw a standard al algorithm at all. I never even really knew it existed at all. Uh, for a long time until I started coming to these C++ conferences, uh, to be honest, a few years ago. And, you know, why do I really need this tool? Because I've been writing software for years in C++, and, you know, I've been just fine. So in about 1976, uh, Nicholas Ver uh, wrote this book called Algorithms Plus uh, Data Structures Equals Programs. I think the title of this book really accurately captures how we write software uh, or what a software program is. Algorithms, usually we have some sort of loops and a series of function calls. Uh, not always. I know there's simple, you know, uh, algorithms or things that run in constant time, but that's usually what I think of or indicating something interesting in a program. I have a loop and, and something executing. And of course, the data structures uh, in C++ are our containers, like standard vector, where we're storing results in our computation and accessing elements and so on. So let's go ahead and just write a few simple programs here and see if this equation holds, see if this captures the instance of uh, software programming. So this is programming part one with standard vector. And this is how I myself sort of learned how to program, and I've observed many others begin learning C++ uh, as beginners. Uh, and I'm not going to say that there's anything, um, well, I'm just not going to say anything. I'm going to leave it open uh, for you to decide. Um, but to the right, I'm going to show an example introducing standard vector um, in some way that you might uh, learn this structure. Um, and I think this example reasonably shows what's available, something that's built in to the C++ language uh, for you to use. So here's where we start usually. We include vector. We get a new container and uh, make this uh, vector data structure available. Then we create uh, some vector. I'm just going to generically call this collection here and populate it with a list initializer. 
elements one, two, three, just some sample data. And then we reasonably introduce a few member functions, pushback, size, operator for accessing, just again showing how to use um, the various operations of any data structure. Uh, and at this point, we probably move on uh, from our teaching onto another data structure, introduce list, a queue, stack, whatever uh, you decide. Uh, and I actually do this in some of my courses when I'm just trying to get the basics of C++, because we're gonna go do graphics or something else. Uh, but often we stop here. And our equation holds, I'll argue this holds, right? This is a program, it works, it's correct. Uh, I have some sort of algorithm here, I'm looping a few times doing something interesting, right? A series of operations, um, I times. Uh, and I have a data structure here where I can store my results and compute something, okay? Or in this case, just print something out, right? It's a simple example for this uh, talk, okay? So where do we go from here? What's our next sort of progression? Well, often we wanna start writing better C++ code at this point. And at this point, we get to make a little bit of a decision, uh, especially when working in C++. Uh, what does better C++ code mean? Uh, and today, since I'm giving the talk, I get to be the boss here a little bit <laughs> and tell you. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, we sort of got two routes here. We're gonna jump straight into optimization land, right? That's why we're using C++. It's an exciting language. We have lots of control. Um, or we can continue learning, you know, more foundational building blocks. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, but, uh, you know, this gets a little bit tricky when learning C++ where the next step is to go. Uh, or even as an educator, what's the next thing that I should show you? Uh, let's go ahead and jump straight into the optimization uh, land though. Because again, this is why we're interested or probably using C++. If not, we might use, you know, different language. And again, what I think is better code often has these qualities. Not all these qualities, again, depending on your domain, but usually we have code that's more precise in what we're trying to say, more resilient to bugs perhaps, more performant, uh, again, on this route, and hopefully easier to maintain or reason about. Okay, so same example that we had before, but I wanna go ahead and improve it. Um, and I'll just pause for a moment actually and see if you can look at this code and you know, if you were just gonna sort of optimize things, what kind of things you would do? I'll just give you 15 seconds to, to think about it. Did anybody in the audience come up with uh, anything that they wanna share? Or what they've heard? Yeah. Okay, uh, let me let me slow you down there. <laughs> I'm gonna have a punchline later, but yeah, some sort of uh, for each loop and something about the, being a little bit more explicit about the range that we're going over. Uh, yep, absolutely. Uh, other things that came to mind? Yeah. Reserve in the vector, right? We know, um, I mean, at least in this case, how many elements we're gonna have here. Uh, yeah, in fact, we could probably just get rid of this pushback, right? This is a yeah, trivial example, but yeah. Uh, another comment in the back? Yeah, dot at i for, uh, we get bounds checking with that, right, versus this is a little bit dangerous, so uh, one of my criteria about being more resilient to bugs, uh, this could help us. Uh, yeah, other thought. Pre-increment for the i, yeah. Um, Post-increment does an extra uh, store, right, and a copy here, so, um, right, we should be explicit about what we wanna do. Um, and I think there's actually, um, you know, you folks, um, I'll give you your, money or your chocolate, I shouldn't say money on the recording, I don't have anything to give you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just walking through some of these, um, you know, you folks are right here, you know, there's many ways we can be more precise, right? Where are we indexing from? Uh, so we might show someone, you know, unsigned int here. Uh, and then we might say, okay, well, let's be a little bit better, you know, size t, um, that's, you know, the type that we use in documentation and is unsigned int, but it's more precise. Um, and then when we're comparing with our collection here, it's an unsigned comparison, so that's that's good, right? And we sort of teach folks that. Uh, plus plus i, the pre-increment, right, which you folks uh, mentioned. Um, but again, we wanna be explicit. Our compiler might fix this for us, um, but, you know, let's do the right thing if we can right away, right? It's not a major change. Uh, dot at uh, i as well, uh, we got here, so improving our, our bounds checking here. Uh, so more bug resilient, perhaps. Um, so, you know, I think we hit the major ones here, uh, or, or many of the different things that we could do. And actually, this, this list can go on and on and on here. 
Um, now you'll notice I, this category here, easier to maintain, uh, remains empty. Um, you know, maybe there's some other things we can do. Again, name our variables better. Someone mentioned a reserve, get rid of pushback. Um, you know, maybe even our comparison, if we want to be explicit, as was mentioned about a for each or some, some sort of loop here, um, you know, why not test i less than or equal to collection size minus one? Uh, again, being being more explicit here. Um, but um, I have, I believe we have improved this code, right? And this is a journey we can take. This is something we do with our code. Um, and I think someone would probably accept these changes in a code review you know, if I brought these and said this code's better. Um, but again, something's missing here about making this code easier to maintain or reason about. Um, and this is a very small example. Um, so maybe we get away with this, uh, but we want to build good habits here. Um, so again, we could argue about dot at i being, you know, making our code a little bit better, more easy to reason about, maybe add some comments <laughs> into this code, why is it here? Um, but overall, as a systems -y programmer, you know, someone who loves systems programming, I love doing these little hand-tuned, uh, you know, sort of optimizations and thinking about these things. Um, but this probably isn't a, a great journey for the long term uh, when it comes about reasoning about our, our code here, right? You take this to a beginner and say, okay, why are we doing plus plus i versus, you know, i plus plus? And that's a whole story we have to explain, right? Um, so, you know, this here, um, I don't know if this is programming, right? Our equation or our, our, my view of C++, again, as a beginner is, you know, we have some loops and some classes and we put those together and uh, that's a program. <laughs> so that's probably the most uh, sort of crude way I could rewrite our equation here. Okay, you know, the loop describing what we're doing here, our class, uh, but this program achieves its job, right? Uh, we've written some software that works. Uh, so thank you, you know, that's the end, uh, and it's time for lunch. <laughs> so we could all uh, go home at this point. Uh, but of course it says uh, 60 minutes here, so we're gonna, we're gonna do a little bit of work here. Um, and remember we have this uh, other road that we could take, uh, learning more foundational building blocks. Uh, so let's try this different path to see what's available to us. So again, you know, in this code sample I have, I have an X, over it, uh, again, not to say that it's terrible code or the worst thing uh, that exists, but it's not hitting this point of helping us write code that's easier to maintain or reason about. Um, so I wanna focus on that part, okay? And again, often as teachers, we do a really good job, I think, explaining different containers, uh, you know, the trade-offs, maybe even the, you know, big O complexity of some of the operations. Uh, for these data structures, and as students, um, I think this is something that folks uh, enjoy learning, right? The data structures is a fun class uh, to take, um, and, and folks can understand this stuff. Uh, but it's this stuff uh, that I wanna, you know, get to uh, towards the end of our, our journey on this uh, zigzag path here. Uh, so we can write better and more maintainable code. So let's start here with iterators. So again, with this question uh, in our mind of how can I make more maintainable and easy to reason about code, usually we need some building blocks, some sort of abstractions that are gonna help us write better code. And we've actually missed a really major part of the standard template library, uh, that is uh, iterators, as I've highlighted here, okay? So what is an iterator in brief in C++? Well, it's some object that allows you to access elements in a collection. So, you know, some sort of pointer to some specific uh, element. And we have uh, built in to the standard template library things like begin and end, whether using as member functions or sort of free functions, ways to access the beginning or the end of a collection. Uh, now, of course, I'm showing here on this figure on the right um, what would be a, a vector data structure here. Uh, but these, uh, you know, having a pointer to the beginning or end element becomes even more interesting when we start thinking about maps or graph data structures as well. But again, for today's talk, we're gonna work with vector primarily. Uh, and the job of the iterator is to advance to the next element in some manner, okay? Usually this means uh, forward, at least uh, for this talk, uh, in a sequential order, okay? But you could go backwards or have iterators that access things randomly or input iterators, output, and so on. Um, but that's, that's iterators. And usually when we have um, iterators, we're talking about having pairs of iterators, at least in most cases, and that's what we're gonna see today. Uh, something that again points to the beginning of our collection and the end of our collection. 
And these pair of iterators we call a range. Okay, so the range from our beginning to our end, uh, that's designating where some computation is going to be performed. Okay, again, that's sort of interesting to just think about where are we going to be computing some results here. Okay, um, so usually we also you'll see in the um, standard in uh, CPP ref uh, cppreference.com, uh, the interval notation here indicating uh, for our iterators inclusive of the begin uh, and the end um, mark here. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about iterators, um, you know, let's go ahead and put them to practice here in our example here. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, begin and end here. So on the code here on the right, you can see now we're, we have our for loop here. We have a vector uh, iterator, uh, it, and that's going to be the collection beginning. And then while it's not equal to the end, uh, do our pre-increment to sequentially move our iterator forward and walk through our vector one element at a time. And now even just introducing this simple idea of iterators is very powerful because we're decoupling how we iterate through this data structure. Okay, that the actual iterator, which tells us how do we get to the next thing, that algorithm, whether again it's moving forward or backward or you know, however we're accessing our data structure, that's decoupled from our container. And we can also again start thinking about this idea of our range of computation. And this example we're again showing from the beginning to the end. Uh, and this is very explicit in, in the actual uh, language or the function calls. Uh, getting to what one of your colleagues mentioned about sort of a, a for each here. <laughs> So again, iterators themselves are important enough that they're a design pattern. They've been marked as a behavioral design pattern. Um, and you know, this shows the intent again clearly, moving beginning to the end here. Okay? Uh, and another sort of added bonus of using some of these data structures is you know, if I wanted to refactor this code, it's likely easier if I said, hey, this shouldn't be a vector anymore. This is going to be a list or um, you know, some other custom data structure that we could refactor this a little bit easier. Okay, I could use standard vector, or excuse me, standard list here and just, you know, change the name here. Uh, I can also do things like just put in auto and I'll take care of it even uh, easier for me, okay? All right, so with the introduction of just one feature uh, in C++, uh, albeit it's a very uh, big feature, iterators, it's an important part of C++. Uh, let's go ahead and review some of the claims I made about writing better C++ code taking you down sort of this other uh, journey here. So is our code more precise? Um, well, you know, the intent is clear. We're sequentially accessing one element at a time. Um, we also didn't really have to worry about some of those other things like size t versus unsize int and, you know, all these sort of, um, uh, I won't call them trivial because they are important, but these little tiny details, right? I'm more just thinking about the, the range of computation. Okay, is this more resilient to bugs? Well, as long as my iterators are implemented correctly, right, that I'm tra traversing from the beginning to the end here, um, that invariant should hold that I can't look outside of this collection here. I can't accidentally increment i or do some sort of computation there. Um, now, I do have a very tiny note here, um, you know, in red, you know, we might have to be careful for erasing elements or if you're in multi-threaded code, uh, we might have to be a little bit careful, right, about uh, changing the state of our collection here. But in general, this is probably pretty good. Uh, is it more performant? Um, and, well, I need to officially measure. I didn't find actually running this uh, example from my previous one meaningful. <laughs> it's a little bit too uh, small of a, of a code here. Um, but the difference anecdotally in my experience has been negligible of using um, iterators versus uh, a raw for loop. Uh, now again, you're going to notice little uh, asterisks and in, in, in tiny uh, red font that you can read later. Um, you know, if you're vectorizing a loop or doing something with, uh, you know, single instruction, multiple data, SIMD instructions, your story might change, right? Um, and, and there's, you know, reasons for that story to change if you're a game programmer or low latency uh, programmer like some of the talks we've seen today. Okay, but um, in general, this change hasn't been the performance bottleneck in the code that I've written uh, in larger code bases. And is it easier to maintain or reason about? 
well, now I think we have something we can actually talk about here. Uh, and I'm going to argue that I have less things to worry about or toggle here. I just want to do some computation from the beginning to the end. Uh, and I just use my iterators to do that. I could change the iterator implementation as well. Again, if I have maybe a more interesting data structure, like a, a tree, and I want to do different traversal. Um, and the client wouldn't really need to know about that, or they would just need to change what iterator they're using, forward or reverse or whatever they decide. Okay, so our iterator against decoupled our traversal uh, from the actual container. So uh, comparing these two examples here, uh, our latest on the right here using iterators and what's on the left here using the raw loop with you know, our hand-tuned optimizations here, um, I'm going to argue that you know, the right side has more qualities of being good code okay, versus the left side. And for someone new to learning C++, though, again, uh, I think iterators are perhaps intimidating. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I have to write. Uh, the compiler is going to yell at me if I miss something here <laughs> or if I forget to put in the right type here. Um, you know, there are some things I still have to keep track of, but I can just use auto here and get the iterator uh, that's returned from the begin. Um, so that's, that's perhaps fine. But I often see folks will shy away and just default to a loop. Uh, because they've learned it first and it works, uh, you know, why bother with uh, iterators here? Uh, but of course I'm telling you, iterators are an important part of uh, C++, the standard template library, and helping us write better, uh, more easy to reason about code. Okay, it's very clear to reason about the start and the end of the computation here. And I also have some good news for those of you who don't like to type. So, uh, in part four here, uh, in C++, we get ranged for loops here. Uh, a more concise uh, syntax here. Um, so I'm assuming many in the room have maybe seen this. If you haven't, uh, well, I'll give a quick example. Uh, but in C++11, we get a range-based for loops. If you're coming from other languages like Python or so on, um, you've had this for a long time and maybe you missed this. <laughs> but you get this much more concise uh, syntax here where you specify what the element is and the collection that you want to traverse through. Uh, and again, it's signaling that you typically want to look at the collection from the beginning to the end. Uh, you know, you could hop out of, you know, early and escape with a break if you wanted. Um, and you do have to make some decisions about, you know, can you modify this element or not. Um, but again, it more clearly signals our intent. And it's a little bit interesting. This is just a little bit of an aside if you want to see how range-based for loops are implemented, you can go click on the CPP Insights link. And again, the font might be a little bit tiny for those in the audience, but you'll see that there's essentially just a begin uh, iterator and an end iterator uh, buried in this code that's generated. Okay, so what was on the left here, the uh, for loop, this thing here just gets turned into some sort of iterator. Okay, now at this point, this is where uh, in my C++ journey, I'm starting to say, you know, C++ is a really elegant language. This is really cool. I can just write code like this. I don't have to write this huge iterator thing or think about indexes. I can just uh, start uh, from beginning to end, look at uh, my data. So iterators provide us uh, on this journey a really great building block for defining our ranges of computation. Uh, and again, that's more thinking like a uh, computer scientist, just thinking about the problem versus what syntax and uh, small details that we have to get right. So our exciting journey at this point is really starting to begin. So now let's go ahead and uh, get into standard algorithm here, okay, and more algorithmic thinking. So I'm going to give a problem. Um, and we're going to solve it, again, the sort of traditional way with raw loops, for loops, and then show it in uh, standard algorithm. In fact, I'm going to solve it uh, many times with many different examples. Uh, so here's the potential problem I have. I'm going to compute the average of all the integers greater than zero in a collection. Okay, so I could have negative numbers, positive numbers, and I'll just compute the average here. And again, this example is probably trivial. It's got to fit in a slide for uh, those here. Um, but uh, I think it's a good problem to start with. And remember, software evolves too, so this problem might change a little bit, uh, right? The software development life cycle. Um, so here's my uh, attempt at this solution here. 
And uh, this code does compile, it does work. Um, no bugs that I know of. <laughs> uh, but let's go ahead and uh, walk through it here. So uh, I've got our collection here at the start. Um, and then the core of solving this problem is going to be to loop through our entire collection. And I need to do some sort of uh, processing of the data. Right? I'm only going to take the positive integers and sum those ones. So I want an average of the positive integers. Okay, so I created some variables here uh, to store the sum, you know, the number of elements that are relevant in our um, solution here, and I'm just going to sum those up here. Okay, everybody okay with that part? Great. Okay, so here's the test um, that these values are greater than zero, um, and again, the accumulation of all the values. And, uh, well, at the bottom, I am taking the sum, all of our elements that have added up, and dividing by however many uh, greater than zero integers we had. Okay, and this works. Right, again, a little bit of a trivial example. One plus two plus three is six, divided by three should give us a value of two. Okay, so that works uh, just fine. Okay, but as I mentioned, software evolves, so let's uh, extend this problem a little bit more. Uh, now we want to keep the resulting set of values. Um, so I want to push these into some other collection. Maybe they're interesting uh, in some way, or again, I want to do more processing of this data. Okay, so how am I going to modify this? Uh, well, I need to store the results somewhere, so I'm just going to have a result collection here. Okay, a vector as well, um, to keep things simple. And, well, as I'm uh, summing up my elements here, we'll also push back all those elements, uh, you know, make a copy of them in this new data structure. Okay, so I don't think anything uh, too wild there. And now we can even take advantage of the uh, size of our collection uh, as well. So I got rid of a variable, the number of elements. Okay, so we have this uh, here again, and uh, I, I promise this works again. We get the same value too. Uh, okay, now I want you to take only the average of the top three values. Okay, so now we need to um, think or add, again, some sort of algorithm here. Um, and before I show the solution, uh, again, let me give folks a few seconds to think about how you would extend this problem. I'll show you what we have here, and if I just want the top three values. Um, and our collection could be anything. I've got a small uh, collection here. I'm going to extend it a little bit. But what, what sort of algorithm would you do? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, okay, so we could run a sorting algorithm. I like it, yeah. That seems uh, reasonable. Um, any other strategies? What other strategies would folks think of? You could sort it in order n using uh, a, a different... Sure, sure. So we could either... Um, walk through the collection three times and take the, you know, uh, maybe the highest element the first time, the second highest, and the third, uh, or use erratic sort. Yeah, these are all strategies, right? Um, uh, so uh, I went with the, the sorting here. I thought about, I tried to think about, you know, multiple ways to solve this here. Um, but what ended up working well, and I extended our collection here just so it wasn't uh, too trivial here. Uh, so we have some numbers that are a little bit scattered uh, right, just to make it um, less trivial here. Um, and, well, I went with the sorting approach here, right? So we need some way to sort a vector uh, and then just take the top three. So that could be the first three elements or the last three, depending on how you're going to sort. Okay, so then I had to think a little bit. Um, and here I had to think a little bit harder um, <laughs> and write an insertion uh, sort here. Um, so I chose an n-squared algorithm. Maybe it's order of n if you get lucky. Um, and certainly there's n log n algorithms, but um, that was too hard to, for me to do, uh, to remember merge sort, uh, or to fit merge sort in a slide, okay? Uh, so this is what I came up with, um, and again, this works here, okay? Um, so 
here we are. Uh, I've solved, or we've solved a non-trivial problem on our journey. We've added some conditionals. We're adding some functions. We're adding some algorithms on the way. Um, and, and again, we're solving problems. We acquired some data, filtered to create a new uh, collection here. Sorted the data. Well, it was already sorted after we filtered it, but we sorted it again. So we got lucky. Uh, and then computed the result, taking the top three values. Okay. Uh, now let's go ahead and look at it in standard algorithm here. And the interesting thing uh, to do this exercise, um, and for folks here, if you want to do this uh, after, or folks watching online, is to actually you know, pause and uh, try to write that example. And then think about how you write it with standard algorithm after. Because the truth is, I was able to just spend time uh, thinking about the building blocks rather than, well, if I go back, trying to remember what insertion sort was and how to implement it properly and how to test it and make sure I wasn't off by one and all these sorts of things. Okay. So with standard algorithm, again, it's about giving us building blocks, just like where we started a few minutes ago with iterators. Uh, this time, I'm just able to look at a library, and essentially what I do, uh, and I'll literally show you what I do here, as I go to this page on CPP reference, and then I look here at all the different algorithms that we have. You saw this scrolling a moment ago. And then sometimes I just hit Control F, and I see is there a way to uh, copy things here? And then I find things. Is there a way to remove things? Is there a way to erase things? Uh, and I see what building blocks are available. So this isn't something that I'm keeping on my head at once. Um, and there's over 105, at least, uh, algorithms, um, C++ 20. Um, so you don't have to keep them all in your head, but uh, at least know where to find those building blocks. So again, why are we going to be using these? Well, general purpose building blocks, easier to reason about our code. Um, I don't know if I've emphasized this enough, but I will share a resource at the end about the importance of avoiding raw loops from Sean Parent's um, 2013 talk on C++ seasoning. Um, and the STL algorithms are you know, well tested. They're debugged, uh, which is more than I can say sometimes about a lot of the code that I write. Um, and generally, you can reduce your code size. Uh, so this is an example from Marshall Claus 2016 talk on the left. Um, I think he did a similar uh, bubble sort here um, on the left. And, well, there is a sort function here. So you get a sort function that does n log n for free. Uh, you'll notice it's you know, three lines of code to uh, create a vector, sort it, and print it out versus you know, two nested loops and, and whatever else is going on in bubble sort, right? Managing your swaps and so on. So again, is this something new in modern C++? No. Um, not at all. In fact, uh, this is an image from 1998. So if you've taken any course since 1998 in C++, um, C++ uh, standard algorithm was there. It was available. Now, did I learn it? I didn't. <laughs> uh, but it's becoming an even bigger part of C++ um, today. So you know, I captured some draft of a standard uh, you know, a few days ago, and you'll see that this list of algorithm categories is growing. Okay, so it's a very important part of the language, uh, or of the library, uh, to be specific. Okay, so let's dive in here. Uh, show you some neat algorithms. Uh, so same problem as before we left off. Uh, the average of uh, the top three positive numbers in some collection. Okay, so here's our collection. Same thing again. Uh, we're going to have a result collection, and this time I found an interesting building block called copy if. And what it allows me to do is move through some range. And if some condition's true, copy that value into another data structure. And that sounds exactly like what we want to do. We don't have to worry about a loop or the bounds or anything. And I want to go ahead and just take a closer look at this uh, for folks who are, again, new to standard algorithm. Because I think this function cop, uh, copy if captures, again, what uh, the sort of uh, syntax is of most of standard algorithm. Okay, so here's copy if, a little bit bigger here. Um, and just take a moment to understand uh, what's going on or how to read this in the documentation. Uh, so what we have here is uh, our first parameters, which is first and last, the range of elements to copy. 
Well, again, if we've been using iterators or range-based loops, we're familiar or comfortable with this, uh, hopefully, right? We can just call it collection begin, collection end, if we want to look at everything, uh, which in this case we do. And then the interesting part, uh, or the sort of what makes these you know, small building blocks is the predicate here that's telling us you know, the condition of when we copy. And usually you're gonna see these written as lambdas. Again, it doesn't have to be. Uh, but here we have a lambda function here that for each of our elements we're taking in, if, well, if this condition's true, that particular element's greater than zero, we wanna copy it, okay? We wanna hold on to it. And where do we wanna copy it to? Well, that's this parameter here. The destination, uh, the first uh, place we wanna um, insert things. I've got sort of this interesting function here, back inserter. Uh, it's an adapter to a uh, iterator that allows us to, if we have a uh, data structure like vector with pushback, it'll insert in the back. Okay, so that's what we want to do, store our, our values. Okay, so we're gonna store all of our uh, positive values in this way. Okay, so here it is uh, side by side. All right, let's continue on. And at this point, we have all of our values in a collection, our results collection, we've copied them, so we can safely do the next portion of our algorithm. Uh, and again, look, no raw for loops needed here. And now we can sort. So we saw that this exists, don't have to write uh, insertion sort or merge sort or pick an algorithm, we get a pretty good one for free, uh, an n log n sort. Okay, so better than my ad hoc sort, it's at least been tested, I know it's gonna work. And if it's too slow, then you can go back and optimize. And now we also have another interesting function here in standard algorithm called accumulate. So I'll give us a moment to look at this, but as the name implies, we're going to be taking some uh, sum of elements. Uh, so from our result collection here, uh, that's a first parameter, the beginning and the end of our range and our starting value. We're gonna start from zero, okay? Um, and I've done something kind of neat here, or what I think is neat, is just taken my iterator this time from the end. We've been seeing this from the beginning every time, but I've just said, all right, from the end, if our elements are sorted, start from the uh, third to the last element and start adding there. Okay, so you can play around with these iterators depending on which way you are moving around with. All right, and here's the full program. And again, you know, what's important is just how we thought about these operations. Uh, you know, we're, I was thinking about what range to copy. Uh, was I gonna sort it? What range to accumulate from, right? If I know I have these little building blocks here, not what loops I was gonna create, is this nested, what's, you know, how to implement insertion sort, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, less thought on these small little details from part one and part two of our vector. Here's our final code. All right, so we have these building blocks and I wanna do a little bit of a rapid fire of just some more uh, examples to show you more of standard algorithm. Uh, you know, just to again, show you what's available uh, and hopefully you're, you're getting more motivated now. Uh, as I referenced earlier, there's more than 100 uh, ST algorithms. If I've lost track, 105 was the estimate from this talk, uh, but uh, Jonathan Bakara gave a really good uh, talk uh, with a nice map of all the different algorithms, um, again, to get exposure here of different STL algorithms. So at a high level, here's how they're uh, categorized. If you go through the uh, documentation, here's uh, you know, roughly a few I'm gonna focus on, um, and just to show you a few. Uh, so as mentioned uh, at the very start of the talk, for each. Uh, so it's pretty much identical to our range-based for loop, which I said, wow, that's a great thing uh, in C++ 11 that's been available to us. Um, but this has, again, been around since C++ 98. <laughs> so it's been here um, for us to, to use here. Uh, maybe, maybe even prior to that. Um, but again, we're pushing our level of abstraction here um, by using for each here. Uh, so just looking at the code here at line 14, um, I have my collection here, and I'm doing something a little bit different here. I've got uh, C begin here. Uh, does anyone know what that stands for in the audience? Or would take a guess? Yeah. Const begin. Yeah, so we got our iterator. Um, 
and this is to help enforce const correctness. Okay, so we have iterators to help us again write uh, better, more resilient uh, code here. So I have const begin iterator, my const end iterator, and then a uh, lambda function here. So what function I'm gonna apply to each of these elements? In this case, I'm just gonna print them out. Okay, so for each. And I'm gonna bring up uh, for each again um, in a moment. Now again, we have our sorting operations that we can do. Uh, so we saw sort, uh, for instance, but we also have handy operations for just checking if something's sorted. Um, so I've modified our previous example just a little bit that I can check, hey, is this collection sorted? Uh, if it isn't, then go through the trouble of actually sorting it. Okay, so you might be able to save yourself some computation in these ways. Again, and just thinking about these building blocks. Okay, because otherwise, how would you check if your collection was uh, sorted? You'd write a little loop and you know check each element and compare them and so on. Now, other operations that often, if you're taking an algorithms class, you learn about uh, or think about when learning things like a quick sort are partitioning. Uh, how do we, um, in general, this is again just algorithmically thinking about the building blocks, how do we take some problem and make it a small problem? Well, often we can partition things into two different sets. So the standard algorithm gives us partition. We also have stable partition if maintaining the order is important. And uh, what I'm doing this time, and this is the same, achieves the same thing as we did uh, before, taking the average of the top three numbers, is I'm partitioning our values into three sets. This time, when I was thinking about it, I just said, okay, I'm gonna partition based on um, the first group are gonna be numbers less than zero, and the next group is going to be numbers greater than zero. Okay, well, actually this might be less than or equal but to, uh, to be extremely precise. <laughs> Um, and then I can just check um, that partition set, right? I don't need to allocate another uh, collection or anything uh, from this iterator that's returned. So this will give me the second group in the partition to the end and just sort that group. And then just take again the last three elements uh, of our collection, okay, in that second partition. So again, this might be saving some computation um, if we can partition things in a smart way. And again, I like to just think about this as, you know, these are um, algorithmically thinking. Now we can also change the problem a little bit. Um, and for folks who work in uh, graphics or image processing, computer vision, um, you might have to write various filters or uh, median filters. So this is where this one comes to mind. Um, but if I change the problem just a little bit and say, you know, we wanna find the average of um, three median values, uh, we have a function nth element, which will return us a median at a location. Okay, so I took the nth element uh, three times here from the median, the middle of the collection, uh, the first time the median, and then plus one and minus one in the direction, took the sum of those and divided them. Okay, um, so that would work, or I could you know, do these one at a time and accumulate them uh, in some way. Uh, and that would be uh, fine here as well. All right, and then things uh, continue to get more interesting because we have uh, various numeric operations. So I've been spending a lot of time creating these list initializers here, but um, really if I wanna fill a range with successive elements, I could just be using iota here. Um, so in this case, I'll draw your attention to line 13 here, where I'm populating this collection which um, I set up to be 10 elements here from the beginning to the end, and we're gonna start from minus five. So we'll get minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, et cetera, uh, incrementing. Um, and then again, if we want some sample data, make things interesting, maybe you wanna create some noise in you know, a program, um, we're gonna use a random uh, generator here, and in our algorithms, we can uh, shuffle our collection. So that's essentially just going to shuffle all of our elements. Okay, so another neat uh, function that's, that's handy here. Um, now you also notice something that's a little bit different about line 18 here. I've got this standard uh, ranges here. Uh, how many folks in the audience have heard ranges uh, previously? Okay, about half of the audience uh, for the records heard it. Uh, any folks used it, used ranges? New feature in C++ 20, uh, might have existed if you used them in Boost. 
But basically, just to give a, a quick overview, because this is where ranges are going in C++, is, well, ranges basically just build off of uh, our algorithmic functions. And they allow us to operate directly on our containers. But what really makes them powerful is the ability to compose some of these operations we've been doing. So we've seen have been doing these step-by-step -step building blocks of uh, copying some values and filtering and uh, accumulating. And for folks who have done MapReduce, this is exactly um, the types of things these composable operations work very well on. Uh, we also get some things like lazy evaluation and so on that um, work really nice in C++. Um, so just to give you the sort of hello world in ranges uh, in C++, I'll, I'll draw your attention to line uh, 18 through 20 here, uh, which I think is the interesting part. Line 12, we have a collection. We use IOTA, which we just learned about, which populates that collection. Um, but then what I want to do here is actually filter and you know, do something interesting with our collection here. So let's just take a moment here. Uh, I'll take my collection. This pipe operator um, is a new thing. Uh, C++ 20 and beyond. And a view is, again, just a, um, a, a, a sort of snapshot of our collection, some range. Uh, and we're going to return all the elements where n mod 2 equals 0, and then transform those elements here. And we can actually run this. Go ahead and click on it here. Here's the example. And again, our collection, we got you know, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, et cetera. So we get all of our uh, even numbers that we're filtering for here. And then we are doubling them. Okay? You can play around with some of these examples here. Again, very clean. And if you think about how would I write this code using uh, for loops and, and so on, it, um, you know, I would argue this is pretty clean code. All right, so we've been introduced at this point to standard algorithm, and now we can actually further optimize. I saw we had you know, optimizations here on our path to the left where we dove into and did some hand tuning, which was pretty interesting. Um, but our journey, again, with standard algorithms doesn't end here. So what about performance when we talk about uh, standard algorithm here and sort of optimizing things? And really, this is going to be about um, opening up our code for parallelism. That's one part of it. Um, I think it's also going to be about opening our code for finding more opportunities about uh, writing asynchronous code, uh, if, that's, if that's allowable, because our code's going to be simpler. Um, so this probably isn't the right talk for measuring uh, performance and that sort of art. But what is interesting or should be known about most of the standard algorithm is that we also have overloads for many of these functions here. At line 15, I'll just draw your attention to for each, where we can have a policy for how we want to actually execute them, uh, whether this means um, as a sequence or as a um, doing parallel processing uh, on the sequence. Um, so there's a really nice talk, and maybe some folks saw uh, Bryce's talk um, this week, uh, or extended on his CPPCon talk uh, in prior, on uh, standard uh, parallel algorithms. Um, so I'll go ahead and just uh, click on one example here, uh, just so you can see it run here. Uh, but the only thing that's really changed here, um, if I can get it to, to run here, um, and uh, well, I won't spend too much time debugging this. If you go to libraries and uh, enable thread um, building blocks by Intel, um, I'm not getting a, a run here. Um, this will run the actual algorithm in parallel if it's available, uh, which is pretty cool. Okay, so for each element, what do you want to do? If you can execute those safely or apply some function safely to each element, you could do it in parallel. So again, take yourself back to some sequential code that you've written in a for loop and think about what your options were for parallelizing it. Maybe you move to a heterogeneous solution with an open CLR CUDA, maybe that's fine. Maybe you've dove into uh, P threads or something of that nature. Um, but that can be much more to manage. Why not just change an argument and say, run this in parallel, it's, it's safe. Okay. Um, so I'm getting towards the end here, and I have a few uh, just bonus sections um, to show folks. Um, but I wanted to see if someone actually noticed uh, an error in one of my code examples. Um, 
And let me see if I'll, uh, I'll try to be clever about this here with our top three sum. Let me, let me go back here so I can show you the code without the solution. Uh, this one here, uh, let's see if I have it. Yeah, did anyone notice a bug here? Norm? Oh, pardon? Yeah, that's, that's definitely one bug, yeah. Okay, so there's two bugs. <laughs> yeah, so I've admitted a lot of uh, error checking, right? Uh, right, I went back to my brackets instead of dot at here, which I probably should have done. Uh, there's something very, very subtle here, and I left it in to sort of prove a point. Whenever I do live coding, I... Could have divided by, by zero, yeah. I'll say it's, it's not something... Um, Arithmetic, I, I promise the program uh, compiles, yeah. Type the floats here on this collection. Yeah, let's see. So, so I think this will still work as far as, yeah, these, these probably could be converted or I'd probably want to use like a static cast to float or something. Um, or, or just do it at runtime, yeah, uh, if I truly don't know. Um, well, let me go ahead and show you the bug here. It, I think it's, it's too subtle, but that's why I left it in. And when I do live programming, I love making mistakes, because then I can, um, maybe not at conferences, but at least in class, because uh, then you can fix it in some learning experience. So here, uh, though, uh, I have a bunch of uh, leftover code when I was doing the uh, sum of three here. I was actually still summing the elements here. And I think any decent IDE or static analysis will tell you, right, when you have unused variables or these kind of things. Uh, but it was a really quick example of, you know, you spend hours building these slides and the examples and making sure that they work right. But even something simple like this um, could have been easily, very easily avoided with using standard algorithm. Right? So I'm accruing some code rot uh, just in a really tiny example. Uh, so I thought that was funny and I was going to poke fun a little bit at myself here. Uh, but again, a little bit of motivation for why to use these building blocks when you can. Um, so I'll also leave this open here to the audience for thoughts. As again, we did our sort of code review or what I claim was better code on this journey that we've taken. Uh, was this code more precise, more resilient, more performant? Um, you know, is it easier to maintain? Uh, thoughts from folks, if any. If not, I just want you to think about it as a takeaway. Uh, I'll give you another chance here uh, in a moment here. I'll give everybody a little bit of homework. You know, the, the conclusion here as we're wrapping up is, you know, we've sort of taken a tour here, and I know it's a, a long tour in, in a way, of going from writing, you know, C with classes approach, a very sort of old school <laughs> way to be learning or writing C++ to using our building blocks, standard algorithm, iterators, these sorts of things are an important part of a language so it can write better code, uh, more flexible code. Uh, so if you're teaching C++ or if you're learning C++, try to start from here. I think it's going to make your journey much more pleasant, you know, as much as it's reasonably possible. Um, you know, so standard algorithm will hopefully help you write much more easier to maintain or reason about code. And if you're not sure, you can do an example like we did today of writing two versions of the code and giving it to a colleague and see what they say. Uh, now there are probably, you know, a caveat, uh, somebody who does a lot of performance work, you know, many examples, again, in game engine programming or low latency systems where you want to use only raw loops and, you know, whatever the cheapest, fastest thing is and take as many shortcuts as possible, right, to make your code very easy for the compiler to uh, vectorize you know, using SIMD instructions or these types of things. Um, but things like our algorithms also have sort of internal knowledge of data structures and they can optimize as well. Um, so it's not as clear cut um, always uh, which is faster. We have to measure. Um, so some of the further resources and training materials that inspired this talk in a way um, I've listed here, um, which you can check out in the slides. Um, these are all wonderful talks and a few blogs and resources for folks. Um, and a little bit of homework, you know, uh, as a professor here primarily <laughs> for uh, anybody in the audience or online. 
um, is you know, take a look at the example that we wrote and see if you can write it in at least five different ways using standard algorithm. And you saw me use it with partition and copy if, and you'll start to question, you know, first you'll just start to see if it works. Then you can start to question, was it efficient? Did we need to copy things? Or if I'm allowed to destroy the collection, um, you know, how efficient can we make it? Uh, and I've given you some ideas here of, you know, there's a remove if. So wouldn't that have been handy? And wouldn't that have been nice, you know, to, uh, if we have this function that safely removes things? They said, oh, erasing within a loops and iterators, that's a little bit dangerous. So there's remove if to help us with that. There's transform. Maybe you make all negative values zero and then do something clever. Reverse things. Maybe you make it into a heap and then just take the top three elements by popping them off. So lots of different ways that you can get creative. And this would be how I would sort of approach, or this is the homework I'm going to give to my students uh, eventually of, um, you know, solve the same problem five different ways uh, using standard algorithm uh, as possible. All right, so at this point, I'll uh, just thank the audience. Thank you for your time. I hope you uh, learned something. I hope you're motivated to learn a little bit more about standard algorithm. Thank you.